of a contribution from the Tweed Project and all these people that you've been introduced to before have been involved. So we've heard a little bit about the end of Devonian mass extinction. Here's the time scale. Devonian tetrapods are now pretty well known. Uh, the last count, uh, including some stuff that's not published yet, there are about 13 taxa recognised from the late Devonian of tetrapods. And those that we know in best detail are very, very peculiar. So we've got a Canthostega with its fish-like tail, tail fins, and its paddle-like eight fingers on the hand and toes on the foot. We have Ichthyostego, which is one of the most peculiar animals I've ever come across, with a paddle-like seven-digited hind limb and many other peculiarities of its construction. And they're nothing like anything that came later. So at the end of the Devonian, all these peculiar things became extinct so far as we know. And the fossil record of tetrapods What's happened to my animation? This is roughly the picture you get. And this is East Kirkton. We have the localities from Tournaysian that Tim mentioned, Pedipes and from Nova Scotia. But apart from that, this is the period known as Roman's Gap, but in which we would have had the origin of the crown roots if we are to believe this phylogeny. So the bird mouth is, as Tim, as Tim has pointed out, represents the whole, pretty much, of the Tournasian. And this slide shows some of the tetrapods that we found there. Here is a bunch of tetrapods. There's some isolated bones. This is where Willie's Hole sits, approximately. And these are some associated bones at the base. So, what I want to point out to you are, are these three taxa here, Stanley, Tiny, and BTB, which is short for below Tim's bed, so it's in here. Here are some other tetrapod bits that have been found from this series. At the base we have the most tiny little Hobos, you can imagine, uh, along with some other little skull bones too. So, what are these animals telling us that we didn't know before? So we picked out a number of <coughs> first occurrences or tetrapod features that we find in later tetrapods, but which are not there in our earlier Devonian forms. So if you look at Devonian skulls, here we've got Canthostega and Ichthyostega, the parastenoid, which underlies the brain case, does not cross ventral cranial fissure, dividing the anterior and posterior parts of the brain case. 
Similarly with ichthyosega, this ventral cranial division is still evident. If you look at carboniferous tetrapods from later in the Westphalians and Pennsylvanian localities, you find that the parasomoid has grown backwards to underlie the posterior parts of the brain case, and you see it here in the quality peton and rear up top. So, one of our bird mouth specimens that we call Stanley for the time being is this here. It's a tiny little creature. This is a 5 millimeter scale bar. That's the photograph. This is the drawing. And here is the parasphenoid, which is the first occurrence that we know of, of a parasphenoid that crosses the ventral cranial fissure. This is another specimen from Tim's bed. We have a parasphenoid here. This is, these are, this is only visible in CT scans. But again, we see parasphenoid not only crossing the ventral cranial fissure, but actually lining the basoterioid processes. And you can actually turn that one over, metaphorically speaking. You can see the dorsal celli, which kind of re resembles that of some tennis bundles. So what's the point of that? It may be that sealing that uh, cranial fissure and joining the two parts of the brain case together helps to, res um, res um, helps to resist the forces that it is newly experiencing from gravity and also the pull of neck muscles on the back of the brain case. Another feature of the brain case that we've also noticed for the first time contrasts these Devonian forms, uh, Devonian and early Carboniferous forms, in which the occipital arch, the basal occipital and the exoccipital, form a unit. You can't see the division between the two. In Folidopeton, for example, an embolomere from late Carboniferous, we see separate exoccipitals. So we've got a suture between the basi-occipital and the exoccipital. This is BTB. Tim showed you that part of it. This is a drawing of the skull region. And here's an exoccipital, a separate bone. We don't, as far as we know, have a basi-occipital, although that might be one. I'm not sure about that. But in any case, they're separate. We've also got a jugal, which I'll come to in a minute. But what's the point of that? Perhaps it's to do with loosening up uh, of the occipital arch. Perhaps it's to do with increased neck movement. Perhaps it's to do with withdrawal, partial withdrawal of the notochord from the basi-occipital. <coughs> but in any case, this is the first time we see it. The cheekbone, here's a hand of Steger, and has a relatively deep jugal, sort of flattened, more or less flattened skull, and only a little bit of the orbit is contributed by the jugal. Um, the same can be said of BTB's jugal. Whereas when you turn to more derived tetrapods, here's pedipes and here's proterogerinus, the jugal is quite deep with only a narrow extent below the orbit. That might indicate increased eye size relative to the skull. It might indicate a deeper skull in which the sides of the skull are more vertically positioned. But again, it seems to be associated with terrestriality. Another example is Stanley. This is the jugal of Stanley. Here it is in the drawing. And again, is this an indication that Stanley was a bit more terrestrial, certainly, than Devonian tetrapods? Unfortunately, we don't have the limb bones for this animal. If we look at the ilium, the traditional and plesiomorphic condition is to have two processes 
on the dorsal part of the ilium. And you can see that here in pedipes, and you can see it here in an, an ilium from joggings. However, there is a derived condition which you see in spondyls like Dendrobaton here, and in Colosteids, like Pleurobaton. Also in this series of ilia attributed to the taxon door of Mesus, which may or may not be Colosteid-like. And the first time we see that in the fossil record is with this specimen that we're calling for the moment Tiny, which is the one discovered by Ben. And here it is. Now we don't really know what the significance of that difference is. It could be that it's nothing to do with terrestriality, but more to do with swimming and tail muscles. But that's yet to be investigated. But what it does show is that we've got some variation and some diversity coming together in the shapes of the ilium, as well as what we see in diversity of shapes of other limb bones, such as we found in Nova Scotia published last year. We've also got some information on the humerus. We have a phenomenon of early tetrapod humeri that's called torsion, where the proximal and distal ends are twisted relative to one another. And a couple of specimens from our collections set us wondering about torsion. Why does it happen and what are the consequences? How does it happen? We've got two animals here, uh, the humerus of BTB and a humerus from Willis Hall. And what we found in them got us wondering further. If you look at the Canthostega, you'll find that the entepicondyla foramen has both its entry point and its exit point on the ventral surface of the bone, running underneath the humerus. In more conventional animals, more, te more terrestrially uh, adapted animals, we get a condition in which the entepicondyla foramen enters dorsally on the dorsal surface and exits ventrally. What's, how, how does the difference come about? Well, the two specimens here that we have show an intermediate condition in which the entry point is actually right on the edge of the entepicondyle. So it's, it's moving from one position to the other. So it's an intermediate. And it looks as though that happens as the humerus becomes twisted, somehow has to move relative to the position of the entepicondyle because you want to keep the course of your brachial artery and, and, the, and the nerve that goes through that hole in a reasonably sensible straight position. So that brings us on to thinking, well, what's torsion about anyway? Why? And this is what the idea that Tim came up with, and it's a simple geometric necessity that a torsion humerus actually allows the epipodials to become longer and to stretch further forward. So here is a hypothetical vertical one, and as you move down and increase your torsion, these epipodials can strike the ground further forward, which by itself helps to increase the stride length. Now there are other things going on at the same time, but that must be one component of increasing efficiency of walking. And that's a consequence of torsion. So evolution of key tetrapod features, lengthening of the parasphenoid, helps to underplate the whole brain case, eliminating the fissure of the anterior, between the anterior and posterior parts of the brain case, comes to line the base pterygoid processes, and might help to consolidate the brain case and resist the forces of gravity and the pull of the neck muscles. The appearance of a separate exoccipital may allow more movement of the occipital joint, may relate to the withdrawal of the motor cord from the brain case, 
An increased contribution to the due, of the jugal to the orbit margin suggests increased eye size relative to the rest of the skull and also a greater importance of vision. Or perhaps, and or perhaps, a, a more uh, vertically sided skull which changes all, a lot of aspects of feeding behaviour. The appearance of the ilium with a single dorsal process characterizes later forms like philosophies and tennis fondles, and we see its first appearance in uh, animal tiny, might be a specialization for swimming or not. And finally, the shift of the antenna foramen entrance to the dorsal surface of the humerus results from torsion, and torsion helps to increase stride length and efficiency of walking. So thanks to all those people, who have been involved with the Tweet team, and thanks to you all for listening.